Forever Ministry, and uh, we prepare engaged in the seriously dating couples for marriage and met some people who are the in-laws for in-laws day and so they were talking about some of that stuff but glad that you're here if you're visiting with us and we're just glad to be together and worship the Lord. Um, you can follow along on you version this morning. Uh, you can also look at the uh, there's some space in the bulletin to make some notes as well but I'm leaving things a little open-ended um, this morning because I feel like that's the way Mark ends his gospel in chapter 16 gives us some things to think about, but really, I'm praying that the Spirit will put on your heart what it is that you need to hear and what you need to think about this morning as we engage the final part of the Gospel of Mark. The story is told of a woman who was uh, looking out her kitchen window into the backyard. She noticed her German shepherd had something in his mouth Upon closer inspection, it was the neighbor's pet rabbit. <clears throat> yeah, it wasn't pretty. She went out there with her broomstick and started whacking her dog until he finally let go of that rabbit who was very much dead. She got into panic mode. They didn't have good relations with the neighbors to start with, so this would certainly make things worse what would she do in her panic what she thought to do was to grab that little corpse take it inside the house and I kid you not give it a bath she bathed the dead rabbit then she hit it with the hair dryer until it was returned to its original level of fluffiness now the next part was tricky she took that rabbit back out cautiously nervously snuck into the neighbor's backyard and put that rabbit inside its cage and closed the door then she went back to her house <clears throat> where she waited an hour passed another hour passed and then shrieks coming from the neighbor's yard she ran out to see what was going on and the neighbor between sobs told her with great horror our rabbit died two weeks ago we we buried her and she's back in her cage wow <clears throat> everybody knows rabbits don't come back from the dead they knew that in the first century that's not just a new thing we figured out uh, neither rabbits nor rabbis come back from the dead and as we come into Mark chapter 16 this morning we're going to see an event for which there just wasn't a precedent this is really a one-off event Jesus had raised a couple of people from the dead but no one had ever resurrected themselves and so we encounter this amazing story and we get a reaction like you would expect from a story that had never happened before. There's some confusion and there is some fear. And I think what Mark wants us to think about today is what will our reaction to this story be. Now we left things in Mark chapter 15. Jesus was very much dead. In fact, just for good measure, the Romans had, had driven a, a spear through his lifeless body taken him down from the cross and then turned him over to a wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea who offered to place the body of Jesus in one of his family tombs and so the corpse was placed there in the tomb a large stone rolled across the entrance notice it's always the entrance of a tomb right it's not rolled it across the exit of the tomb there's a reason for that people don't come walking out of tombs sealed it and then we pick up the story in Mark chapter 16. When Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might anoint the body of Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, good question here, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone 
which was very large, had been rolled away. Hmm. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, before we go any further, I assume most of you have English Bibles. In your English Bible, there is very likely a note here, maybe an asterisk that you can click on and get the note, but it will inform you that in all likelihood, this is the end of Mark's gospel, that the rest that we have there in chapter 16 was added at a later date. We won't get into all of that. There's pretty good evidence there, but honestly, we don't know for sure whether verse 8 is the original ending to Mark's gospel or not. Very likely it was. But I think what you could walk away saying is, I think you could see why someone might want to put a little longer ending there. They fled and they were afraid. That's not the ending that you would put on the story if you were making it up. It's, it's rather abrupt. But Mark's beginning was abrupt as well, wasn't it? You go into Mark chapter 1 and you don't get a birth story. You don't get angels and shepherds and a manger, you get Jesus 30 years old starting his public ministry. That's what you get. Abrupt beginning, abrupt ending. Mark is kind of all about being abrupt. After all, this is by far the shortest of the four Gospels. And I would say that Mark's Gospel is very unlikely to be the one next spring on Easter Sunday that you would hear a preacher like me using um, we much prefer the other three Gospels because if Mark had just, I mean, if he had just gone 12 hours further into the future, just 12 more hours, you get a much more, I think, satisfying ending to this because within those 12 hours, the two Marys are going to see Jesus. They're going to have a conversation with Jesus. A disciple named Cleopas and one of Cleopas's friends, they're actually going to meet Jesus on the road to the village of Emmaus, invite Jesus into their home, break bread with him. In those next 12 hours, Jesus will personally meet with the 11 disciples and have a snack with them. So if you just go another 12 hours, you have Jesus personally interacting with a, a wide assortment of people. Anyway, if Mark had just gone another 12 hours into the future, <clears throat> It'd be much more satisfying, I think. Instead, we've got Mary, Mary, and Salome finding the tomb empty, encountering the angel, and running away afraid the end. So why were they afraid? And as we walk through that question, <clears throat> and as we consider some of the details in this story, I believe we find that there is good internal evidence in the gospel of Mark to suggest that it is a real historical account. It is not a work of fiction. Like if the story of Jesus were fabricated, if this was a manufactured story, Mark would not have ended it with the words, they were very afraid, right? That, that's not an ending that you would put on this story, not if you're trying to invent something to bolster Christianity or to help it get off to a strong start. However, if you're simply relating the facts, if you're simply giving a historical account, then this is what you would expect. Why would they be afraid? Well, for starters, they've just had an encounter with an angel. The stone is rolled away. They duck their heads. They go in. There's an angel sitting there. Other gospel writers will tell us that the appearance of this angel was as lightning. Have you ever experienced a lightning strike that was a little too close for comfort? 
I bet a lot of us had. Imagine a lightning strike maybe 10 feet away from you, having a conversation with you. Scary. Angels presented to us in the Bible, they're not presented to us as chubby, cute little cherubs. They are awesome and terrifying celestial beings. And over and over, when an angel has an encounter with a mere mortal, their first words are, don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. Because to encounter an angel you think your life is over. It's an overwhelming face-melting kind of experience. They're not going to ask you, hey, did, did you catch the Astros game or how you doing? Their first words are going to be, hey, don't be afraid, I'm not going to kill you. So yeah, they'd be afraid. And they were afraid because no one have, had ever resurrected themselves. Ever. No person had ever resurrected themselves in the history of the world. This was a one off. Nothing like this had happened. So it was kind of intense. Now, most Jews, most of them did anticipate that there would be a resurrection, but their understanding was the resurrection would happen at the end of time. When that happens, the world is over. The idea that, that someone be, would be resurrected midstream, middle of history, that just wasn't something that they had ever thought about. And so if the ladies were able to get past the initial shock of having an encounter with an angel, then they would have been disturbed they would have had difficult mentally processing the resurrection of Jesus because this must be the end of the world. That's a little scary. I think we could agree. And if the resurrection was something made up to spice up Christianity, it wouldn't have been written with everybody. In all the Gospels, by the way, the first encounters with Jesus were fearsome. Everybody got scared. They wouldn't have written the story that way, but it is exactly what you would expect if it's relating truthful events. That's the way it would have happened. Verse 8, again. Trembling and bewildered, <laughs> the women went out and fled the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid the end. <laughs> If this were a contrived story, that's just not the way it would have been written. And check this out. If this were a manufactured story, I can assure you women would not have been written in as the first witnesses. We're talking about a patriarchal, chauvinistic, male-dominated, first-century Jewish society. Women were not regarded as having equal status with men. Far from it. In fact... Their testimony, their witness would not even be admitted in a court of law. Not legally valid to have test. If you robbed a bank and the only witnesses were a Mary, a Mary, and a Salome, you're good. You're not going to prison. That witness is not valid. And so there's no way, if this is contrived, that they would have, to bolster Christianity, had illegitimate witnesses there to be the first ones to behold the empty tomb. So why would Mark and the other gospel writers, all of them record that the first witnesses are women because they aren't, they aren't making it up. <laughs> That's the way it happened. That's the way it happened. And seriously, I just think about this this week. If you were making up a story that would be hard to believe and you've got these three witnesses that you're putting into the story, would you really give two out of the three witnesses the same name? This incredible thing happened. You're never going to believe it. The people that saw it were Wendy, Wendy, and Jennifer. I mean, would, would, I'm just asking, would you make that up? But it is the sort of odd detail you get when something is true. It's not something you make up. It's just recording what happened. It was Mary, Mary, and Salome. And of course, Jesus had, we know this, he had talked to his disciples about his resurrection 
be killed. Three days later, I'll be raised from death to life. He talked about them, but none of them, because this is so shocking, none of them were like, everything's going according to plan. They're all shocked. They're all afraid. And I mean, they scatter like soldiers who a grenade has just been thrown into their foxhole. They're gone. And then all of a sudden, those same disciples who were afraid, who were bewildered, who were confused, all of a sudden, they seem to find such clarity and courage. And we know this from the Bible and from sources outside the Bible. Many of them all of a sudden are willing to to take great personal risk, even perhaps die, rather than recant their story. We witness the resurrection. We've talked with Jesus. We've seen Jesus. We've broken bread with Jesus. And many of them would, in fact, lose their lives because they would not retract those stories. And that's kind of the effect, I suppose, that witnessing a resurrection would have on you. Everything would change for you. Everything. History has been interrupted, rebooted, flipped on its head. And for these witnesses, everything turned on this one day, this moment. The fact that the tomb was empty and that Jesus had risen. Now, this isn't mythology. This doesn't look at all like stories of Hercules and Apollo and people like that. I mean, Jesus was a real historical person. We know that. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. He was a carpenter's apprentice. He became an itinerant rabbi for several years around Galilee. It's not a fable about Greek heroes or something like that. And after his resurrection, all of a sudden exploding on the scene, we have a very real church with very real people a lot like us who are claiming that their lives have been transformed by this resurrection. Now, Mark's gospel is a bit of a cliffhanger. The end is sudden. It's kind of open-ended. The women found the tomb. The tomb was empty. They were afraid. So what did they do? Did they believe? Did they rejoice? Did they follow the angel's instructions and go tell everybody about the fact that Jesus was risen? Mark doesn't say. I know, we can, we can cheat, right? We can go to one of the other three Gospels and see what they did. But Mark just leaves it open for us. I think he wants us to wonder what happens next. I think he wa- wants us to wonder what are the ladies going to do with what they've just witnessed. I think he wants us to ask ourselves, what will we do with what we've just seen? Here's what I think. I think if you're convinced, if you know that the tomb was empty, if you know that the Lord had risen, I believe it infuses you with hope. I believe that every morning when you wake up, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're up against, you have hope because of the empty tomb. I believe it's hope not just for an afterlife. I believe it's hope that, it, that infuses the way you live and work and minister right here and right now. Tim Keller, pastor in New York City, shares a story that I think gives um, some helpful perspective about the resurrection. He says, imagine that you have two women of the same socioeconomic level, same educational level, even the same temperament, You hire both of them for your factory. And you say to each of them, you are part of an assembly line. You will take part A and you will insert that into slot B. Then your work will be turned over to someone else who will do the next step in the process. You're going to do this over and over and over and over, eight hours a day, every day. You put these two women in identical rooms with the same temperature, with the same number of coffee breaks, with the same lighting, with the same everything. And to be truthful, it is very boring work. 
Their conditions are the exact same in every way except for one thing. You tell the first woman, at the end of the year, you will be paid $30,000. You tell the second woman, independently, at the end of the year, you will be paid $30 million. Now, in a couple of weeks, you'll find the first woman complaining, isn't this the most boring job ever? I think I'm going to quit. Isn't this driving you nuts? And you would hear the second woman saying, are you kidding? This is the best job ever. I can't wait to come to work. I whistle while I work. What are you talking about? So what's the difference? What's going on? Well, you have two people in identical circumstances experiencing the same things, but they're experiencing those things in radically different ways. What makes the difference is this. It's their expectation for the future. It's their understanding of what's coming, of what it's all about. And here's the thing. What you believe about what is coming, what your expectations are for the future, that changes the way you experience today, tomorrow, every single day. It changes it. So what is coming? What does the future hold? Well, as believers, we are full, we are even overflowing with hope. Our future is secure in God's hands. Our sins, because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, they have been forgiven. Washed clean. The grave will not have the last word for us and for those that we love because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, we are, as Paul says, more than conquerors in this life, no matter what we are up against. Because of Jesus and because of this story, we know that hope wins. Love wins. Well, we'll just finish here. What about you? What does the empty tomb mean to you? What do you believe about this story? How do you live differently because of this story? And maybe this morning it's time to give your life to Christ and be buried in baptism in the name of Jesus into his death, burial, and resurrection. Or maybe you just need prayers. Let's respond. Let's respond to God as we stand together and sing.